America used to be considered a godly country. It doesn't seem to be that way to me now. And I don't mean to be disrespectful or anything, but it's so many things they're okaying for the wrong reasons. There's not godly reason. People need to really open up the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, and look in it and, and, and really get it into their heart. And this, the way the, uh, the Reverend Hood is doing this, this is a comfortable way. It's not forcing anything on people. It's a comfortable way and a loving way for it to continue to move in that direction. The way Reverend Hood presents it, uh, you can understand it and it makes you want to delve into the Bible even more so that you can see more uh, because uh, it seems like his, the program goes off too fast. <laughs> we need the bread, the bread of life. We really do. Uh, these days we need it more than ever and Reverend Hood's ministry on TV is giving us our bread. Hello, this is Pastor Nick Hood, and welcome to Nick Hood Ministries. Today I want to talk about loneliness. I don't know if anybody looking at this has ever been lonely, uh, but stick around. I want you to think about your thoughts, and we'll be right back. This is a new ministry which is just starting. Reverend Hood needs your help in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and His power throughout the world. If you would be so kind as to send a donation to Nicholas Hood III Ministries of any amount, Reverend Hood will send you a free, complimentary copy of his book of original personal prayers and beautiful photographs, entitled The Test, The Strength, The Endurance, and The Way Out. We appreciate your support, and in this way, you can partner with Reverend Hood in sharing the good news of Jesus throughout the world. Please make your check out to Nicholas Hood III Ministries and mail it to 4535 Chrysler Drive, Detroit, Michigan, 48201. America used to be considered a godly country. It doesn't seem to be that way to me now. And I don't mean to be disrespectful or anything, but it's so many things they're okaying for the wrong reasons. There's not godly reason. People need to really open up the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, and look in it and, and, and really get it into their heart. And this, the way the, uh, the Reverend Hood is doing this, this is a comfortable way. It's not forcing anything on people. It's a comfortable way and a loving way for it to continue to move in that direction. The way Reverend Hood presents it, uh, you can understand it and it makes you want to delve into the Bible even more so that you can see more uh, because uh, it seems like his, the program goes off too fast. <laughs> we need the bread, the bread of life. We really do. Uh, these days we need it more than ever and Reverend Hood's ministry on TV is giving us our bread. Hello again, this is Pastor Nick Hood. Today I want to talk about loneliness. Thank you for being with us. And today <clears throat> I have a special guest all the way from Atlanta, Georgia, the Reverend Dr. Dwight Andrews, pastor of the First Congregational Church in downtown Atlanta. Dwight, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Nick. It's great to be with you. All right, today I want to talk about loneliness. The Surgeon General says that loneliness is a killer. He says that uh, many people are suffering and sometimes dying early because of loneliness. And the more I listen to him talk about loneliness, the more I realize, I say, I don't think I'm lonely. Uh, I, and I, I misspoke in front of my church uh, several months ago uh, when my brother died. I said, you know, I think I'm lonely uh, because I don't have anybody I can talk to the way I talk with my brother. But it dawned on me, I said, you know, the way I really talk with my brother Steve was tidbit conversations where we might talk two to five times a day, not for very long, but mm -hmm. going to a meeting, leaving a meeting, and so forth. And I said, the more I think about it, I don't think I'm lonely. 
I said, I think I'm grieving. <laughs> you know, but mm -hmm. there's a difference between mm -hmm. grief <clears throat> and loneliness. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell a little Bible story. Once you think about it, I know you've already read this story. Uh, but, uh, and then I'm going to come back to you. And I want to ask your thoughts about loneliness. In Matthew chapter 26, <clears throat> round verse 41, Jesus, you know, Matthew's an eyewitness account to the death of Jesus. And Matthew says that Jesus said, you know, he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. And, uh, and before that, you know, he's praying on a mountain. He takes Peter, James, and John. They go up a mountain, and Jesus tells them one thing. He said, just stay awake. Some more modern versions say, he says, be alert. Mm -hmm. But stay awake. And then he says, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak indeed. But just stay awake. And I've been asking myself, why did Jesus want Peter, James, and John to stay awake? And Brother Dwight, I think, is at least two reasons, mm -hmm. maybe more. <clears throat> Number one, Jesus maybe just wanted their company. Mm -hmm. You know, that, you know, he, he was alone. Mm -hmm. This is the night before he dies. He knows he's the Son of God. He knew he was going to be crucified. He knew that his death was going to be an ugly death. And, uh, and, and, but to that, he says, stay awake. And a little later, he says, you know, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak indeed. And then a little later, he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And Jesus, I think, wanted company. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, he knew he was dying, but he wanted company. And there's nothing wrong with admitting you want company. And matter of fact, I'm glad to have your company on this show <laughs> right now. But uh, give me your first thoughts about Jesus asking Peter, James, and John to stay awake uh, while he was praying. Yeah, I think you hit it right on the head, Nick. Uh, I, I think that there is something about, and we, we call it a ministry of presence. Uh, the idea of having uh, the disciples with him, they didn't have to say anything. He just wanted them to be with him as in that, that critical moment uh, in the end of his life. And so I, I think sometimes we can be in the midst of people but people are not present with us in that moment. And so uh, I always think of that, uh, that final part of Jesus' journey as being um, a very lonely journey because only he could walk that path. Uh, but he was asking for company to just be in the midst of it. And even that, the, the disciples failed miserably. But I think that's a reminder for all of us that uh, sometimes we have lonesome journeys that we have to travel all by ourselves, uh, but still we want company because it's always better when you're not going it alone. Uh, but then there's another aspect about loneliness in terms of how I think how we think about it today because for many of us, uh, we're in the midst of a lot of people, yet we feel alone and disconnected. And when you look at the statistics around mental health, suicide, um, violence by suicide, uh, by guns rather. Um, I found that many of the people that I'm working with are very, very lonely and isolated and just want to have <clears throat> meaningful company uh, with them in their journey. And I think that that's a part of this difficult moment in our world, Nick. We are, we're not connected to one another, even though we're in the midst of big crowds, even though we have 50,000 friends on Facebook or TikTok. In the midst of all these technologies, many of us feel disconnected from one another. So as a pastor, what do you say to a person who is um, alone uh, and wondering whether or not they are lonely? Hmm. What, what do you, you know, what, 
What do you, what do you say to <laughs> yeah. them? Well, I think as, as, uh, as Christians, what we try to encourage people to think and to believe is that they are never alone. That, that God and Jesus is our partner in all, of our, in all of our situations. And so in that sense, we may feel like all of our friends are not with us, but what we know by faith is that Jesus is with us and that uh, we are never alone, as that song used to uh, remind us. My, my dad <clears throat> used to sing a song called You'll Never Walk Alone. It was from some old theater song. And, uh, but that was a very, very powerful song as I got older. That's from South Pacific, yeah, I think. Yeah. But interestingly enough, for my father, who I think was very lonely, uh, I think that there was a powerful expression. There's a reason why he sang that song that I didn't understand until much later as I tried to better understand him and his challenges. But he had lots of family, lots of friends, but he was alone and felt lonely, I guess. Mm -hmm. When I listened to the Surgeon General talk about loneliness, and he talked on a very personal level, saying that he was lonely as a child, that when his parents would drop him off at school, he had anxiety feelings because he didn't have friends in school. And the more I listened to him, the more I realized, I said, I never felt like that. And part of the reason why I never felt like that was, one, I liked school, and I'm sure he liked it. He's a medical doctor, so I'm sure he did well in school. Mm -hmm. But I like the social aspects of school. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, my mother would say, I probably like the social aspects of <laughs> school much. too much. Mm -hmm. My mother used to catch me daydreaming uh, while doing homework, and she'd shout at me saying, focus, black man, focus. <laughs> and I'm a little boy. And she'd say, focus, black man, focus. The black man's problem is a lack of focus. <laughs> Taught like a true teacher. And it was hilarious. Uh, and it's funny, I mean, all these years later, I'm still laughing about that. But uh, part of my lack of focus then was my friends. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, friends I played football with. Friends um, I would goof around with during recess at school. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I had no problem making friends. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, uh, you know, one of the things I want to focus on is, I mean, Jesus picked 12 disciples. Mm -hmm. He took three of those disciples on a mountain with him uh, to watch him while he prayed. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is the son of God on one hand as being very God, he really doesn't need other people. But on the other hand, he does need people. Mm -hmm. He's also very human. That's exactly and right. you and I need people. We need friends. Uh, I'm going to uh, take a pause right now uh, for just a minute. But when we come back, I want to talk about some concrete ways that people can deal with loneliness. If you're watching this program, I want you to think about yourself and ask yourself, am I a lonely person? And stick around because when we come back, I'm gonna give you a few concrete things you can do to take away your loneliness. We'll be right back. Reverend Hood needs your help in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and his power throughout the world. If you would be so kind as to send a donation to Nicholas Hood III Ministries of any amount, Reverend Hood will send you a free complimentary copy of his book of original personal prayers and beautiful photographs entitled The Test, The Strength, The Endurance, and The Way Out. We appreciate your support and in this way you can partner with Reverend Hood in sharing the good news of Jesus throughout the world. Please make your check out to Nicholas Hood III Ministries and mail it to 4535 Chrysler Drive, Detroit, Michigan, 48201. America used to be considered a godly country. It doesn't seem to be that way to me now. And I don't mean to be disrespectful or anything, but it's so many things they're okaying for the wrong reasons. There's not godly reason. People need to really open up the Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, and look in it and, and, and really get it into their heart. And this, 
the way uh, uh, Reverend Hood is doing this, this is a comfortable way. It's not forcing anything on people. It's a comfortable way and a loving way for it to continue to move in that direction. The way Reverend Hood presents it, uh, you can understand it, and it makes you want to delve into the Bible even more so that you can see more uh, because uh, it seems like his, the program goes off too fast. <laughs> we need the bread, the bread of life. We really do. Uh, these days we need it more than ever. And Reverend Hood's ministry on TV is giving us our bread. Hello again, this is Pastor Nick Hood, and today we're talking about loneliness. We're talking about the lonely Jesus. The night before he died, uh, falling down on the ground in prayer with Peter, James, excuse me, and John, and asking them to stay awake. He says, stay alert, uh, and, and just watch and pray. And I really believe Jesus wanted company. And there's nothing to be ashamed of if you want company. Uh, but we had to be careful, Dr. Andrews, if uh, all we need is company, we have to make sure we have good company. <laughs> That's right. Uh, because sometimes your company will get you in trouble. That's right. That's right. Uh, but uh, as I promised at the end of the first segment, I want to talk a little bit about concrete ways we can overcome feeling alone. And uh, since you are my guest, Dr. Andrews, I just ask you, what what uh, nuggets of wisdom would you share with somebody maybe who's looking at this right now who's lonely? Well, one of the things that uh, came to mind is the way in which uh, that ministry of presence that I mentioned, you know, just having friends who are there with you and having friends that can just be there when you need them. They don't have to say anything. They just need to be there. And I was thinking about our relationship over the many years. We've buried our parents, uh, siblings. Uh, but when I needed you, I never had to call you. You were there, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what makes me feel like I'm never alone because I have good friends uh, who understand how important their presence is. But then sometimes I think when we're alone, we're thinking that the loneliness gets fixed with someone coming to us when I think in some ways we can also go to others and solve our loneliness by connecting. We don't have to wait to be connected. We can be the connecting. And so I encourage folks to, to develop relationships that are perhaps underdeveloped and to make connections that, um, that have perhaps not been fully explored because that makes all the difference in the world. We're not powerless. So suppose a person looking at this program is listening to you, you know, say, well, make friends. Well, suppose they're uncomfortable in making a friend. What would you suggest that they do? I suggest that they take baby steps. And they, what I mean by that is, I don't know that we go out and make friends, but I think we put ourselves in social uh, situations where people uh, who have uh, similar interests, uh, similar concerns can just make connection and the connection can then unfold. Uh, I think sometimes we're, we're, we're looking for the shortcut to developing relationships, and I think that begins with just reaching out. Uh, and sometimes reaching out in the most innocent ways can lead to important relationships. So if a person has a passion about something, uh, go to where other people are passionate about the same thing. Uh, if it's the ecology, if it's serving young people, uh, go where other people of like minds are there and doesn't have to be in church. Just go and then find people that are empathetic with what your ideas and aspirations are. And I think that's, that's how it begins. The other thing is I think that we need to always uh, just remember that, um, that we have power in making connections and we don't have to wait for someone to come connect with us. We can connect with others. And I think it really is critically important. The other thing, though, I would say is that, you know, we live at a time where people's relationships one to another are really under, underdeveloped. I don't think we have a lot of experience with relationships. I counsel a lot of couples who have not been in serious relationships 
and really don't know how to be together. What does it mean? And so pr getting practice of being in relationship is also a help. Mm -hmm. One of the things I would add to that, and I, I think you're right on the money, uh, you know, in terms of the relationships. I would add that if a person is lonely, if they feel like they're alone um, and don't know where to begin, one of those baby steps, as you call them, taking baby steps, mm -hmm. one of those baby steps actually is simply to engage in acts of compassion, mm -hmm. to engage in something worthwhile, mm -hmm. something meaningful. And in the process of doing that, you may make friends with somebody else who wants to do something worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a real life example. My eldest son, Nathan, who you know, mm -hmm. um, all the way out in California. When he was, you know, after graduating from college, he worked hard, got a college degree. He worked for one or two years, maybe three years in New York. And uh, he had an opportunity to work in San Francisco. Goes to San Francisco, but he, found that the job that he took in San Francisco um, was different and it, it had it, 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 it gave him stress mm -hmm. and he felt like he couldn't he might not keep up with that job mm -hmm. and so he quit the job he said I'd rather quit than be fired and as a father you know with my kid <laughs> 2,000 miles away I'm saying what in the world do I say to my kid now and to both of our credit, my wife stepped in. I think she's the one who came up with this because I don't think my son did on his own. Mm -hmm. But I think she encouraged him to go to the library every day, look for a job. But at the same time, she encouraged him to volunteer mm -hmm. uh, in something of public service. Mm -hmm. he, he was very good at mathematics. And so he volunteered for a free tax assistance program mm -hmm. and in the process of doing that um, he helped people for free he was giving back you know and I forget how many hours a week he would do that while he was still working looking for a job as it turned out he bought a one-way ticket back to Detroit and he said if I don't have a job by X date I'm coming home and as good parents we told him of course you can come home uh, but as it turned out, one or two days before that one-way ticket was to take him back to Detroit, mm -hmm. he found a very nice job in San Francisco. And he's never looked back. And one of the best things that he got from that job was he met his wife. Yeah. And they've been married now several years. Uh, but the point that I'm making is, and, and, the, and let me finish the story. The other thing that he did that I'm so impressed with is that he still volunteers at that free tax agency. Wow. Now he's making a lot of money now. And in addition to making money, he's selling real estate in the California market. So he's doing very well, but he still gives back. He said, Dad, I wanna give back. He said, because this was important to me when I didn't have anything. Mm -hmm. And when I really needed encouragement, emotional encouragement, being able to volunteer was very important. And you know, it's a funny thing, that free tax agency has offered him a job, <laughs> you know, to work. They said, we'll pay you. Yeah. He said, no, no, you can't pay me. Yeah. I'm giving back. And he feels good about himself. And, and so to me, that's one example of a person who actually dealt with being alone in a very positive kind of way um, it's a great lesson. Uh -huh. Yeah. One of the other lessons in dealing with loneliness is that we have some technological tools in today's world that I think actually encourage being alone. For example, how many times have you gotten a text message from somebody? Sometimes people will send you a text message that sounds like it ought to be, it reads like it ought to be in a book mm -hmm. because it's pages yeah. long. And people, I find, some people are much more willing to text than they are to call. And I find myself, if, you know, if somebody texts me, I try to respond. 
But one of the things I do instinctively is if it goes past two text messages, you know, mm -hmm. in an exchange, mm -hmm. I pick up the phone and call. Cool. And I get different reactions. Some people really don't want to talk to you. Right. They would rather text. But there are more people than not seem to be so happy to have a, a phone, you know, a phone conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, in yeah, a world of text messages. That's a very important lesson, and I think that that's one of the dangers of the tools of technology. And I find that even with my college students, that they would rather send an email than to sit and come and just chat with you. And that is a part of a kind of culture of lonely people, you know, where they, it's easier to be anonymous in writing a text rather than looking face to face or talking phone to phone. So I, I think you've made some great points about compassion and also connecting that, that resonate. And in that anonymity of the, the text message, there's also a defensiveness. Mm -hmm. and, and the defensiveness is the text message or the email is almost as if a person is putting up their hand saying, uh, this is as far as I'm going. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna show you a little bit you remember our preaching instructor, Bill Kennedy? What <laughs> Kennedy, he, he taught us a lot of things. This is at the Yale Divinity School, all places. But one of the things I distinctly remember him doing, d demonstrating was he said, you know, if you can preach in a church where you don't have to wear a robe, he said, wear a nice suit. And he said, and if the crowd, if your audience, the congregation gets bored, he said, just open up the lining. He said, show them, here's, I'm showing you my line of the day. Well, what am I doing? Well, and this is not a very flashy lining, but there is a vulnerability mm -hmm. in showing yourself mm -hmm. to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in the process of showing yourself to somebody else, that lays the foundation for a greater relationship. Yes. Uh, Dwight, we're about out of time. Uh, do you have any last thoughts on loneliness? I think that one of the uh, wonderful things about not being lonely is having people in your life that can make uh, a difference at a critical time of your life that changes you forever. And as you were talking, I just remember that when my mother died, uh, your dad came to the house and he took me to McDonald's. He just <laughs> took me out of the house. He took you to McDonald's? Took me to McDonald's so we could have a cup of coffee and he could just be a minister of presence. Mm -hmm. And I never forgot that. I can imagine mm -hmm. my dad taking you to McDonald's. Well, that's a powerful the lesson. Com compassion and, of Mickey D. And I never felt alone. Never felt alone. Well, on that note, we're going to wrap this up today. Again, thank you so much for tuning in to the Nick Hood Ministries. I need your support. This is a new broadcast ministry. And if you are able to support at any level, write a check, a tax-free check to Nick Hood or Nicholas Hood Ministries at 4535 Chrysler Drive, Detroit, Michigan, 48201. God bless, God keep you, and remember, I'm praying for you.